and welcome back to another episode on GEMS Podcast. I am your host, Genesis Amaris Kemp, and with me today on this fantastic Friday is Laquita Monley, and here's a bit about Laquita. She wears many hats in addition to being a devoted wife, military spouse, mother of five, and grandmother of five. She also operates in purpose and expertise as a savvy real estate investor, transformational coach, teacher, trainer, and international speaker with the John Maxwell team from the United Kingdom to Kenya, Germany, and back to the U.S. Laquita's mantle is to charge others with the task of progressing into the best version of themselves. Laquita loves to equip individuals, organizations, and ministries to unlock their full potential and live out their mission in the most authentic way. And today we're going to be diving into who or what is defining success for you. And without further ado, welcome Laquita Monley to GEMS Podcast. Hey, it is great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I can't wait to have this, this great conversation. We had a little hiccup on our first go round. Mother Nature wasn't our friend. And now we get to do it again. So I'm really looking forward to, um, to having a great conversation with you today. Woohoo! And you know what they say, second times are charm. So yeah. Laquita, <laughs> you are definitely multifaceted and multidimensional. So outside of all the things that we mentioned in your bio, what are some fun facts that maybe your audience doesn't know and my audience surely doesn't know? <laughs> so um, let's see, fun fact, I absolutely love basketball and I have a extremely competitive nature on the court. Like I have no chill <laughs> at all. So, and now in my adulthood, with my children, my, as they were going up, I felt it was my mission to harass the referees at the basketball game to let them know, like, how did you miss that call rep? To the point where I actually went to take the class to co- become a certified rep <laughs> so that I could argue the point. Like, it was so much fun. It was so much fun. I came, th- I mean, I was always just a hair dab away from getting ejected from many games. But my <laughs> children, I was in the building. I was just about to ask that. And how many games did you get kicked out of? (laughs) After a while, the refs got to know me because, again, I took the class. And so some of them will remember me because you have to keep the certification up. And I was like, Miss Monley, can you please not today? Like, we can't, we're human. We can't see everything. But you have your assigned area. You need to see that. You need to see your area. Because if you don't, I shall let you know (laughs) that is an amazing fun fact and did you ever play basketball in high school or at a college level I played basketball in high school however I did not get an opportunity um, to play basketball in college I was recruited but um, I got pregnant as a teenager and I ended up choosing to be a mommy and a wife instead of immediately going to college Ah, and that's a beautiful segue into our topic. Who <laughs> or what is defining success for you? Because getting pregnant at a young age, such as a teenager, some people may think that your pathway is not going to be what it's supposed to be because you're mm-hmm. now a mother and they may want you to take a back seat or they may try to place their limitations on you. So at that young age and going into adulthood, becoming a mother, a wife, and whatever other dynamics you had going on, how did you ensure that you were the one in the driver's seat and not somebody else? So great question. And it took me a number of years to figure out I was not in the driver's seat. So, and all of the things that you just said, it's very real. I grew up in the 90s. I'm about to tell my age. I'm I'm not 25 or 35. So <laughs> and so, you know, in, in the 90s, um, late 80s through mid 90s, there was this really big stigma. And a lot of young girls were getting pregnant as teenagers. And so everybody was like, oh, teenage pregnancy, teenage pregnancy. 
this is what you need to do. You know, you need to um, get your GED, get your, you know, home economic skills and what have you and learn how to, you know, live within the system. And for me, that was like, wait, what do you say? It's like, how am I supposed to do that? It's like, lady, I don't live in the projects now. Why do you want me to move there? And nothing wrong with living in the projects. Be very clear. There was a point in time when my family did live there. But, you know, my parents and my grandparents worked very hard to not be there. So why would you send me back? You know, and I thank God for putting the right people in the right places. So when those, um, when people's thoughts were being pushed on me at high school saying, Laquita, you need to, you're getting close to the time that you're showing, you need to pick a date and time where you're going to go to the VOTEC and start taking these classes. Oh no, you're showing, uh, it's a liability to the school's insurance. You need to do this. Um, and so we initially thought that I had to do all of these things and like dim my light because that's what the school was telling us. And because I was a teenage pregnancy, I had been assigned a social worker um, for high risk. And on one of my particular visits, um, she asked me, you know, what was it that I wanted to do next? Because at this time I'm a junior in high school and she asked, okay, you know, well, what do you want to do? I see where your grades are. I had like a 3.7 GPA. Prior to that, I was around, I uh, played basketball, I ran track, all of these wonderful things. And I told her, I don't know, I can't do any of the things that I want to do because this is what they're telling me I have to do. And she looked me dead in the eye and said, who told you that? That's not true. That's not state law. The way, what you want to do, college or what have you, you can still do it. It's going to be a little bit harder now that you have a child but at this particular point in my pregnancy, she had been with me for a number of months. So she had gotten the opportunity to know my, my boyfriend, now husband, and his family and my family. And so with that information, she was like, now you, you're going to be just fine. You have the support system that you need. You just need to create the plan and stick to the plan. And you guys will be just fine. And I went to school. Um, the next day and let them know this is not what we were going to do and let's just say they made it very uncomfortable for me up until the point that I gave birth um, because I was standing my ground um, and a lot of young ladies and, uh, and and older ladies we one of the things that I love to talk about is who or what is defining success for you because someone else's ideas or ideals do not have to be yours I don't care how wonderful they might be or how bad they might be. You don't have to own that. You figure out what it is for you and then start to map out that process. Exactly. And I love the fact how your social worker looked you dead in your eye and told you that that did not have to be mm -hmm. your plan. And she was real with you because had you not had her in your life, you would have thought what the school said was final. Mm -hmm. And I, and I also love the fact that you and your boyfriend now husband are high school sweethearts. And so with both of you being young parents, what was that dynamic like? Because I'm sure both of your parents are trying to tell you, oh, you should do this for the baby. You should Absolutely. do that. <laughs> so, and that's a, <laughs> that is so important because that could be uh, defining the success, not just for you, but for your child, because mm -hmm. you want to be the best mother that you can be just like he wants to be the best father but if you have those outside voices and factors coming in mm -hmm. then it's almost like it's trying to shape success for you and your new mm -hmm. family that you're coming into it, it's funny that you say that because there's a particular incident that happened we laugh about it now I did not laugh the day it I didn't laugh for a long time after it happened but again we were teenagers so mm -hmm doing what teenagers do in relationships. And on this particular weekend, we didn't like each other. And it was his weekend to take our son. So I was bound to determine not to make it easy on him because I knew he was trying to go out. And I know for sure I was going out. This is what was happening for me this weekend. <laughs> and so my cousin 
was with me. Um, she was my ride. She was my ride, you know. I think every Black person has a cousin named Peaches, and that was I, my cousin Peaches, was there to get me. And my grandmother, because I was living with my grandmother at the time, she says, Quasha, my family calls me Quasha, you, you need to get that baby together for that boy so he don't have all that to do. And I'm like, why? <laughs> he, he can bathe him. He can do all of these things. And she asked me three times. And all three times I had a reason as to why I was not going to bathe him and get him ready for bed and all of these things. And on that third time, let's just say what you would think happened in an African-American home in Mississippi happened to me. And I was traumatized. I wasn't tra traumatized wasn't the thing. It was like, I can't believe I just got a whooping because she just came at me. I got a whooping and it's my kid like make that make sense but I didn't say it out loud because I didn't want to get another one so <laughs> my husband was there at the time and him and my cousin knew that I was about to get this whooping that I didn't know was coming because of the way that I was turned and so later I'm like why you guys didn't say nothing you could have said something and they both looked at me and said I didn't want to whoop me but like what are you talking about but after a couple of days when everybody's temperatures went back to normal, my grandmother and I had a conversation. She explained to me why she felt disrespected, which is why I got the spanking. And I explained to her why I was standing on what I was standing on and how I felt disrespected. And we had to set a boundary. Yes, mm -hmm. I live here. And yes, I, am, I honor you. I respect you. And I'm going to do whatever you ask of me between me and you. But when it comes to my child, we have to set a boundary because yes, I understand what you were saying, but he made this baby with me. So I, it's not my mission at that time to make his life easier and make my life more difficult. Nobody can make that make sense to me, you know? And it, it was, it's funny now, it was not funny then. But it does happen. And it didn't just happen to me. I've got tons of funny stories between my husband and his dad, <laughs> how he didn't like the way that my husband was raising my son. It happens. And you just have to learn to set the boundary very early. Because if you don't, um, it could turn into something crazy. And, and also at the same time, you have to recognize wisdom when it's coming at you as well. And, and be able to receive some wisdom and some insight and know how you want to implement it or if you're going to implement it. Don't completely reject everything. But in some of that, it is wisdom because you're alive. You know, like I'm alive and they got me here. So they might know a little something. <laughs> and that is a funny story because it's like now here you are even though you're a teenager you're grown because you just birthed life so it's like you're responsible for that human yeah. being and the fact that you you tried as well as had to establish boundaries is so important because people um forget to realize that boundaries is a sign of respect and that is a, a sign of you defining um, how people are going to respect you and mm -hmm. how you want to be portrayed and you know receive because if mm -hmm. not things can easily go sideways in a minute because Absolutely. somebody says something and you know depending where you live if you pop off at the wrong person you might get clocked upside your head that part, <laughs> that part. <laughs> because and I've seen it and it's and it's not right but you know when you grow up in certain homes like they feel like if they're the adult, what they say goes. Mm -hmm. Even if you are a mother and you are of age, they still mm -hmm. feel like they have some form of authority over you. Mm -hmm. And that should not be the case because you're not defining my life for me because mm -hmm. you're not paying these bills that I have to pay. And it's no disrespect or discount to you. It's just mm -hmm. times and seasons have changed. Absolutely. And it's, you know, and it's, <laughs> I think the, the, the blessing that came out of that, that incident was my grandmother and I began to see each other in a different light. Like she was angry and I was angry. 
But when we had that conversation, a lot of, and, and I, and I can, and I'll say this, I, I have to give my family the credit that they deserve. Um, yes, it was your child and you're going to do as I say, as we were growing up, but it was not like we were without an opinion. I was not in a situation where I was without an opinion. And so that's why I was able to have that conversation with her. It wasn't over the phone. It was in person, face to face. I was sitting on her bed in her room and she was sitting in her favorite chair and we're having this dialogue. And, and she said, okay, you know, after I explained my position, I don't know whether she liked it or not. The important part was she understood my position and she respected it. And from that point forward, um, my, our relationship as it, as it pertained to how I was navigating my relationship with Ben and how I was developing myself as a mom, things became a question and not a command. And that made a big difference. Wow. And I like how you said things beca um, became a question and not a demand. That's very profound. And that um, also brings me to where you and Ben are right now success wise. So as you transition and you started to move away from your family, um, what, what and who defined your success for you then? Do you think that the military played a heavy part in navigating the success pathway that you and Ben are on currently or have been on? It did. It, it, it did. So, you know, because we were children. So what we learned along the way is throughout your life journey, consciously and subconsciously, we're collecting data. And as we're collecting that data, we're putting, we're writing a story in our mind. That's not a bad thing. But oftentimes we don't relate that story out our mouth to our significant other. It says this, you, you should understand this. Like this isn't your story. And we began to realize that we had two different stories. And both of our stories were steeped in our experiences growing up, our experiences me as a military spouse, him as the service member. And out of an argument one day, he said to me, you know, this is not TV. This is our real life. You know, we, that, that stuff can't happen. This is our real life. And he was speaking about one of my favorite shows, The Cosby Show. And we were arguing. He was like, we're not the Hustles. This is real life we've got to deal with real life. And, and but that, that was a light bulb moment for me. Like, wow. Okay. Did not realize that I had been trying to live out, not just, not just a TV fantasy, like I wasn't that crazy, not trying to live out a TV fantasy, but having that ideal of the perfect family, living in the military, being a military family, especially living abroad, you have so many restrictions. And I'll, and I'll even say this, being a military family that's African-American, being a military family that's African-American, and my husband had a senior position and he's in the intelligence community, the level of stress to be perfect was overwhelming. Because, I mean, you're Black in America, that's a stress. And have these other things added to you was an additional stress. So trying to figure out what success was for the Monleys, it took some time. And, and once we were able to define it, then we had to set those boundaries with everyone else around us. Like, I don't care what your expectation is. This is who we are. Like it, leave it, love it. I don't care, but this is who we are. And your expectation means absolutely nothing to me. Hmm. Yep. And I like the fact that you don't carry the weight of other people around with you, mm -hmm. because if you do that baggage, whether it's physically, mentally, or emotionally, it's going to weigh you down and you're not going to be able to cruise to higher elevations or altitude because you're carrying the weight of something that was not even supposed to be assigned mm -hmm. to you. And at what stage, because you 
you already had a son at a young age. At what stage did you start expanding your family? And how was that um, dynamic wise built into your success? Because it's easy with one kid, but when you add on additional children, your time stretches and the resources stress stretches and there could be external pressures that are applied to you especially if your husband is deployed or if he's away and you're doing it by yourself that is also a defining moment because oh. you're the who and then the what is your family and those external factors that mm -hmm. also have to complement the who and the what to define your success does that make sense it does so we didn't plan the children, but we also didn't plan to not to have them. So they came very quickly. <laughs> so they are, my oldest one actually, his birthday was yesterday. And so they are 27, 26, 25, 24, and 20. <laughs> I forgot you have five kids. So 26, no, no 27. 27. 26, 26, 25, 25, 24, and 20. Oh my gosh. So you had diapers, multiple diapers. Yes. The stair step. The stair steps. I was like, oh, what is this? So again, we didn't, we didn't necessarily plan to not to. So it happened. You know, we were frequently happy to see each other, apparently. But at that point, you know, to be honest, I was running on autopilot because if I would have taken too much time to think about it and think it through, I don't know if I would have made it. And also to be perfectly honest, I did not have postpartum depression after my first child, but I did after everyone else. And I did not recognize it. My husband recognized it um, because he did attend the new parent support group meetings and different things like that with me. So he recognized it and got the support that I needed after the birth of the other children. And with that support that I'm a really big advocate of mental health uh, in our community, get it, like it, love it, you need it. It should be like your annual dentist cleaning. It's a preventative measure, get it all the time. Um, and so that helped us. And, and in that, it also opened up our ability to learn how to effectively communicate with each other so that while he was being soldier and I was being the housewife and the mom, we could then figure out, okay, what these bills look like without killing each other. Like, you know, sometimes it was more month than it was money. And that was a frequent thing. So how are we going to manage these bills? You know, what, what does money management look like? What does it look like for me to get an, a, a job that wasn't feasible? I wanted a job, but it wasn't feasible. We had so many children, daycare would have been costly. So what does it look like for him to get a second job? And that's what would happen. He would have a second job. He'd come home from work, get something, eat, rest up, and then go back out again so that we could, he could earn the extra money that we needed. And we had to be, learn really quickly what it meant to be good stewards over everything that God gave us, the, the family that he gave us, each other and our money, because we were like most Americans, you weren't work. The money that you earned wasn't enough to sustain you, but it was too much to get any assistance. So we had to learn how to work together very quickly at a very early age because I was 18 when we got married and he was 20 and the we had another baby coming quickly so we got we got we left home in 1996 and um our next our third son was born in 1997. Oh wow and then so where were you in the equation to take care of the who part because from call oh no from high school into wanting to go to college but you put it on hold because now you're raising a family were you ever able to go to college or do something for Laquita while being a mother and a wife so great question and that really opens up to how I begin to learn to define success for me as an individual 
So all of these things I'm doing to keep the family going and in the relationship and all of this and not fully realizing I lost myself in all of that. Um, at age 25, we were, we had just moved back from Fort Lewis, Washington to the Killeen, uh, Texas area to Fort Hood. And I was extremely irritated. Like I was in therapy, but I was always irritated. And it was because I was either Devante Dario, Denise, David, or Marquez's mom. I was Staff Sergeant Longley's wife. And then we joined the ministry that my mom attended. And so I got to church and I was Sister Kim's daughter. I didn't have a name. And that day in and day out of that for like the first two months, I exploded one day. Like I have a name, I have a purpose. Like, but then I'm saying that angrily at this individual, poor person, you know, <laughs> poor sis, she didn't mean to harm, but she got the business. But as I'm saying that, I really realized, but who am I? What do I like? What makes me happy? What am I passionate about? You know, I have no idea. And it was in that moment, um, I realized that I needed to do some things differently. I didn't know what at that time, but I realized I needed to do some things differently. And I was just really starting my adult journey in the Lord. And so my husband was deploying and I said, okay, you know, Lord, I want this time that he's away. I need to understand who I am. And in that year of his deployment, his first deployment, he deployed with 4th ID um, for that initial invasion of Baghdad in, um, in 03. And while he was fighting a war on one front, I was fighting a totally different war here at home internally within myself, trying to figure out who I was. And when I realized who Christ was and who I am in Christ, everything opened up and it made a world of difference and how I saw myself and valued who I am. Uh, because at that particular point until then, I really had, and not knowing, I was devaluing the roles that I played. And those roles are significant in the woman that God created me to be. Mm, yes, and that's what I wanted to pull out of you. As you see how all my questions start to fit together <laughs> as a perfect jigsaw puzzle, because it's so important that you don't lose your identity in other people and things because they expect a certain measure out of you. You mm -hmm. have to know who and whose you are. And once yes. you do, you could put yourself back on the potter wheels just like God is molding you into that beautiful masterpiece he created you to be. But if you're so busy pouring into any and everything and you're not pouring into yourself, mm -hmm. then you're going to hit that period of mental burnout and exhaustion. Yes. And yes. then once you hit that period, you're going to have a blow up and a blow out, meaning that you are going to explode onto somebody else. And that person, they're on the receiving end and they're like, what did I do to him or her to deserve that? But they don't know that you may be going through spiritual warfare or you mm -hmm. may be going through internal warfare mm -hmm. and all of the stuff is just compiling upon compiling upon compiling until you hit that blow up and blow out just mm -hmm. like a tire has a blowout then yes. you realize it's time for me to look within and do the work and mm -hmm. I'm gonna get there by doing a self-discovery exercise and asking myself who am I and get back to your core and mm -hmm. your core has to be aligned mind body and soul which mm -hmm. is going to be connected to you mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And mm -hmm. that is how you're going to know who or what defines you, your success, and where you're supposed to be in life. And when you get there, then you have clarity to know yes. the vision. And once you have clarity to know the vision, you could start to understand and walk out your mission and purpose for existing here on earth. Absolutely. Absolutely. When the during that time and, and even now, um, I spent a great deal of time journaling. And through that journaling, and my I developed a habit of, of waking up about 3 34 in the morning and having that quiet time in prayer, in meditation, um, and in journaling and getting in the word. And it was through that 
that I really, really, really began to have a deeper understanding of just whose I am, like the goodness of God, the glory of God, the majesty of God, and the fact that he loved me unconditionally. But most importantly, he had a plan for my life before my conception. And everything that had taken place in my life up until my, that moment of my realization, those things had just been preparing me for the place that he has for me. When those pieces came together, it was like, wow, I'm unstoppable. Like I am amazing. I am fabulous. I am this beautiful creation. And no matter what I do, it's going to prosper. Through journaling through that journey, journaling through my journey, that has been one of the biggest things um, I would say as, as a key to the success that we currently that I'm currently experiencing at this point in my life. Because it's it gets it clears the brain, it clears the mind. It's like in that in that time of journaling and, and meditation, that's when I like to say the download can happen. That's when the download can happen and I have clarity, not with my music playing, not with any of that great stuff happening, but in that, in that quiet time, in that time of clarity, that is really when um, the Lord really showed me who I am and who I am. And once he showed me that purpose, also began to show me a roadmap on how to achieve that. He defined success for me as an individual, not outside entities, not pop culture, current culture, not friends, not family. But when he showed me what success looks like, I realized I was already successful. Despite what people might think or say, I was already successful. Steward that success. And he's going to show me how to get to a greater level of growth, a greater level of maturity. And that will cause different natural things to come into place. Like when I, when you're maturing and you're growing, you know, if I could keep a $1 allowance, then my daddy gonna give me a $5 allowance and then maybe a $10 allowance. That's how that looks. Just if, if we're talking about, okay, natural things. But who I am today, that growth journey, that success journey, it started at age 25 when I realized I had no idea who I was. And I took that year that my husband was deployed to search out the father to learn who he is and who I am. And he showed me that I was already successful. And that from that point on, it's just been, wow, okay, I'm unstoppable. I can do anything I put my mind to. Wow, that is incredible to just hear the journey because you went through a lot, but it also taught you something each, um, each path of the way and your pathway became illuminated through each season. Each test became a testimony yes. and each mess became a message. And as we wind down, Laquita, I want you to give the listeners as well as the viewers three tips to help them know who or what defines them and not get it confused? Tip number one, when you wanna know who or what defines you, start to set a regularly scheduled, non-negotiable quiet time for yourself. If you're a morning person, do it in the morning. If you're a late night person, do it in the late night. If you're saying, Laquita, the only time I can do that is on my lunch break, do it on your lunch break, but make it non-negotiable. Why? Because giving yourself that time in prayer, meditation, and journaling, everything will begin to be clear. Number two, give yourself grace in this process. However old that you are when you start this journey, baby, it took you that long to figure out you need to start the journey. Give yourself grace. It's not a microwave. It's not going to happen overnight. Start the process. Give yourself grace in the process. And number three, rejoice over every small victory that you get in the process. Do those three things and you'll start to see 
and your vision will become clearer. Your perception will become clearer. And that very thing that you once thought was everything, you'll see how insignificant it was. And you'll begin to realize how significant you are and that anything you put your heart to, you can have it and you will have it. And Laquita, how can our listeners and viewers connect with you on social media? And what's your website? My website is www.laquitamonlet.com and they can connect with me on social. I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, IG, um, Facebook, and also YouTube simply by typing in my name. If you go to Google and type in Laquita Monley, all things Laquita Monley, it will pop up. That's kind of good and kind of scary, but if you type my name in a Google search, you can find me. I'm most active, however, on LinkedIn. And in case you're wondering, the spelling of Laquita is L-A-Q-U-I-T-A, last name Monley, M-O-N-L-E-Y. So there's no excuse. And until we chat next time, peace, love, and lots of blessings. Have yourself an amazing day. And remember, you are an asset and not a liability. Yes. You deserve to be where you have been. And no one can define your level of success if you are not giving into them. Mm -hmm. Start your own path, pave your own journey, and take life back by getting in the driver's seat of your own life and live life on your terms. Don't forget to subscribe to the platform on all major podcasting device. And you could also follow us on YouTube at Gems with Genesis Amaris Kemp for the video content. Thank you so much. And we really appreciate everything that you do day in and day out to make this podcast amazing. Once again, I'm Genesis Amaris Kemp, and my guest today was Laquita Monley.